Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the National Secular Societies podcast and part 4 in our series, Exploring Religious Freedom. I'm Alice Lichten, Head of Education at the NSS, and in this series I'm speaking with a variety of experts and activists about religious freedom. What does it mean? What are its limits? And how might it be abused? Listener, I'm going to give you a little peek behind the curtain here and let you know that today's episode comes a bit out of order. I like to space the episodes out regularly, but sometimes you just need to grab an interview with a subject when you when you can. So in this interview, I spoke with Anne-Marie Gaylor, and you'll hear us mentioning Religious Freedom Day in the US, which is on the 16th of January. Anne-Marie Gaylor is a co-founder and co-president of the American-based Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'll be back at the end of the interview with some reflections and closing remarks. Enjoy. Annie Lurie, welcome to the NSS podcast. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. You're co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I wonder if you could start by telling the audience a little bit about the FFRF and how you came to be a secularist activist. Yes, I am a co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and uh, I co-founded it with my mother, and Nicole Gaylor, back in 1976 when I was a college student, and she was a very well-known feminist activist in Wisconsin and, and nationally. And we, our eyes were open to the dangers of religion and government because she, in her work uh, to uh, legalize uh, contraception and abortion in the state of Wisconsin, and we realized that the only organized opposition was religious in nature, and they were trying to inflict their dogma on everyone else through civil law. And she was asked to go national with the group in 78. And I became co-president with Dan Barker in about 2005, I think. And uh, we are in our 41st year, and we have rectified many violations of the separation of church and state, taken over 70 lawsuits, won most of them. We have uh, grown from the original two of us to over 31,000 members in North America, and our members are mainly uh, non-theists, atheists, agnostics, skeptics, rationalists. We like to joke that we don't care what you call yourself. We all disbelieve in the same gods. So we have two purposes, to keep religion out of government, to defend the constitutional wall of separation between church and state that's in the American Constitution, and to educate the public about non-theisms, to promote the Enlightenment, to promote the free thought point of view, and represent free thinkers especially uh, interested in keeping religion out of social policy. So the FFRF advocates for religious freedom and the separation of church and state, uh, but you come at that from a specifically non-religious perspective. Yes, we do, although we do represent uh, religious people in some of our lawsuits and some of our legal complaints. What do you think the strengths and weaknesses of that approach are? The strength is that we are purists. Uh, we don't get, uh, we don't have a conflict that oh, suddenly we're taking a position that our church is going to not like. And that's one of the things that has freed the Freedom From Religion Foundation to uh, be absolute in our uh, definition of separation of church and state and to take some lawsuits that some of the other groups that have religious ties would not be willing to take because churches are not comfortable with them. Um, and one of the weaknesses, of course, is that we're a great minority in the United States. But since FFRF was founded, of course, we've seen enormous growth in the number of seculars. And it's never been a better time in the United States to be without religion. We have a lot more company. And there's about 24% of the population identifies as non-religious, not necessarily as atheists. And we're seeing much higher numbers among the um, gener what's called Generation Z, uh, young people in their teenage years. Uh, we're seeing up to 36%, and 21% of them actually saying they're atheists or agnostic. So if, that's a huge sea change here in this country, where we're finally catching up with uh, the free thinkers in, in uh, the UK and in, in much of Europe. Uh, but because we are a minority, um, I think that, of course, that makes it harder and sometimes people will say, well, why don't you just work for separation of church and state? And then anybody of any belief could join you. And this is true, but we 
like to point out there are other groups for believers to join, such as Americans United for Separation of Church and State. And um, so, you know, we I think the more people fighting the same problem, chipping away at the same problem from different perspectives, makes our movement stronger. So this is a part. Of, this uh, is part of a series of discussions about religious freedom. How does freedom from religion relate to that? Well, we believe most sincerely that there can be no true religious liberty without the freedom to dissent. You cannot dissent once there's religion and government. Watch out. And then in, invariably persecution follows, as Thomas Paine wrote so many years ago. We also feel that secularism is a prerequisite for women's rights, for LGBTQ rights, um, for uh, unfettered science, which is, you know, stem cell research is still greatly fettered here in the United States. You can't really have true liberty if you have religion and government. There might be a perception that freedom of religion is for the religious and that freedom from religion is for the irreligious. Is that fair? And if not, is that a problem for those advocating for the separation of church and state? I think there's a definitely a perception among many Americans that freedom of religion does not encompass any freedom to dissent or freedom from uh, for atheists or agnostics. Um, but when you look at the word of and from, they're really the same word. You know, in French, de means of, de means from. Um, it, the concepts go together. And in the United States, we have the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That's the Establishment Clause that's interpreted to have a wall of separation between church and state. But the second prong is or uh, uh, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and that's the freedom of religion. And so the two things go together. And really what the First Amendment is about, what religious liberty is about, is about freedom of conscience. We all have freedom of conscience to decide whether to accept or reject religion. That's what we're fighting for. We were originally scheduled to have this meeting on January 16th, which is uh, Religious Freedom Day in the US. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges facing organizations like the FFRF and the NSS is a sort of redefining of religious freedom in the hands of uh, not exclusively, but largely reactionary groups as being about the freedom to impose religion or an unlimited freedom that overrides other rights. What do you think we can do about this, um, what we might call a distorted version of religious freedom? It is one of the biggest fights that we have here in the United States. And of course, Religious Freedom Day is the anniversary of the issuance of the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty written by Thomas Jefferson. And that became the cornerstone that led to the First Amendment in the United States and actually uh, often the, um, the main text of it, the most important paragraph of it, is repeated almost word for word in probably about 35 state constitutions that uh, it, uh, no citizen shall be compelled to attend, erect, or support any place of worship or support any ministry or religious teachers. And what makes the point about what you were saying, what the evidence of that is that the religious right is turning, is weaponizing this very date, this anniversary. They're trying to turn Religious Freedom Day into a day that celebrates taking away religious liberty. Uh, there's or organized, um, this has all been organized and orchestrated by the religious right to turn this anniversary on its head. And this is exactly what is happening in the United States. We are seeing courts even, and not just the religious right, use language that is appalling. Um, we just had some arguments by the Trump administration against the contraceptive mandate. And this has been one of the biggest religious freedom issues in the United States uh, because we had the Hobby Lobby decision by the Supreme Court that said that Obamacare's contraceptive mandate that said, uh, uh, Workers have to be, women workers have to be given contraceptive, contraceptive appointments without extra penalty. And the Hobby Lobby decision by the Supreme Court said that if they had a religious objection, employers could actually veto this kind of health care or what kind of contraception 
women workers choose. It was a horrible decision. And they're still arguing for this, and they are using the language that we use at the Freedom of, from Religion Foundation, saying that workers, um, I'm sorry, employers have the right under freedom of conscience to dictate to employees what kind of contraception they may or may not use. They're using the same language we've been using for years. It's uh, incredible. So might this be a case where some people's religious freedom needs to be uh, restricted or limited in order to protect the religious freedom of others? Uh, uh, the religious freedom that uh, to manifest your belief that you don't like contraceptives bumps up against other people's religious freedoms or, you know, or indeed freedom from religion. Yes. I mean, they have the religious freedom to avoid or eschew any kind of contraception that they want. That protects their freedom of conscience. They don't have the right to force their contraceptive choices on others, especially their employees. And especially when it's a corporation, it isn't even a church. And the Hobby Lobby ruling was a disastrous ruling, which we have you know, protested vociferously, and it has led to quite a groundswell of opposition. Um, and we're fighting, we're still duking this out. But um, there's no question, uh, there's some famous quotes, you know, your your freedoms end at, the, at my nose. I mean, you can't swing your, your fist at somebody's nose and say that's your freedom. You, you can um, see that we have checks to so-called religious liberty. We um, don't allow polygamous marriages in the United States, for example. We don't, in theory, allow child brides. Um, we, uh, you know, you, you can't cr commit crimes in the name of religion, although they happen frequently, and that's not justification. So, of course, there have to be checks and balances. Uh, but what the religious right and the Trump administration is saying is that if you are religious, the rules don't apply to you. And not only that, but you're allowed to force your religious views on others. If that is someone's view of what religious freedom means, and obviously you know, I think we, we, hold, we hold quite a philosophically similar view of what religious freedom actually means, how can we resolve these two understandings? Well, I think through education and persuasion and common sense. Um, you know, it would be like uh, if, if at the Freedom from Religion Foundation we said we're all atheists here and um, you're, not allowed, you know, you're not allowed to get pregnant. You're going to have to have an abortion. That's our religious freedom. You know, it, it, it's absurd. I think you have to show examples of how absurd it would be if we forced our views on religious people. Uh, and uh, more education about why the United States was the first among nations, I mean, talking, you know, to people in this country, to separate religion from government. It's something that we should be proud of. And for years we have seen it um, st stigmatized and we have seen public officials make um, remarks against it. It's like they're even afraid to say anything that is pro-separation of church and state. We have lost a lot of ground since uh, Robert Kennedy as a candidate felt compelled to make his famous speech before Houston ministers saying, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute. And he went on in great depth and detail to say why religion should not be in government. We don't see anybody saying this anymore. There's been quite a disinformation campaign. And even among progressive causes, it always seems like the secular principle gets to the bottom of the list of to-dos. You know, first there's protect abortion rights, and then there's protect LGBT and this and that and the other. And nobody's thinking about the overall picture that so many of these attacks are really attacks on secularism. So what do you think the biggest challenges to freedom of and from religion are today? The biggest challenges, I think, are conveying why it, why we adopted it, why it's essential for secularism and freedom to uh, prosper. I think maybe the history has been forgotten in the United States. I don't think children get civics lessons anymore. They're not taught to revere some of these constitutional principles as they were in my mother's time growing up in the 1930s, for example. The education I received was very different. In the United States, we have seen incursions that have mis 
educated the public, such as the adoption of um, uh, the words under God in our Pledge of Allegiance that tie piety to patriotism, um, putting the motto in God we trust on money and saying it's, it's a second motto for our nation. That all happened in the 1950s. And we get continually asked these questions by the media and the public. How can you say that America isn't a religious nation when our motto is in God we trust? And we always say, well, it was a Johnny come lately. It doesn't belong there. It's not even accurate. To be accurate, it would have to say in God some of us trust. And that would be a very silly motto. It's exclusionary. And I think this, these things have miseducated the public and we need to remind them of our secular heritage. On the surface of it, that I mean, having the, nas- the national motto being in God we trust kind of seems like a you know a minor religious privilege, a concession to the majority. How does that trickle down into tangible restrictions on religious freedom? Well, it is used as precedent to excuse everything else that entangles religion and government, and we know this from 41 years of experience dealing with public officials and dealing with a hostile public. They all turn to these kinds of examples to justify worse violations. The symbolic um, violations are among the worst in terms of the harm they create, and they're among the top 10 or 3 even that we get complaints of from our many members around the nation. And it's, it's just uh, justified a lot of violations. And it's a lot of ignorance that we need to confront. And I would also blame religion, um, the, the religiosity of the American public, in my opinion, is how we got to where we are today politically. It has dummied down our nation. Um, if um, It isn't that surprising that we would have a president who plays with facts and talks about um, you know, alternate facts and fake news when religion is basically the original fake news. And when people are taught to believe, it's fine to believe anything that makes you feel good. It doesn't matter whether there's evidence for it. Okay, and for those who don't share that perspective, for those, you know, who, who are religious uh, either culturally or in terms of belief, how can they be persuaded to support the separation of church and state, how can you know? How can they be said to, to show that that's good for them as well, particularly if they are a member, of, you know, currently privileged majority? Well, separation of church and state is good for everybody. All we have to do is look at history to see um, who you know. Whoever, whenever you get one sect in power, it goes after all the others. So you know, we have seen historically all kinds of. Um, discrimination, religious wars, pogroms, you name it, against the wrong religion. You know, to be Catholic used to be practically a crime in some countries and in some colonies here in the United States, um, much less to be Jewish. Um, The Protestants have been themselves discriminated against when they're living in what is basically a Catholic theocracy. The only way to protect everybody is to have a neutral government. And we have a bumper sticker at the Freedom from Religion Foundation that's applicable here in the United States. Protect the First Amendment, it protects you. So we all can live in harmony if our government stays out of the religion business. But once it enters religion, as I said, watch out. What role do you think that schools can play in improving the public understanding of uh, religious freedom or the separation of church and state? Well, in the United States, I would say better civics lessons about the Constitution and and how it was developed. Um, I guess that globally, when we have um, study history and study the history of law, history of democracy, um, it's very important that the role that religion has, the negative role that religion has played um, in suppressing rights and starting wars be objectively um, analyzed and discussed. Um, and there shouldn't be this assumption that everybody is religious. And perhaps that doesn't happen uh, in some of the other nations. Um, it certainly happens in the United States, uh, where um, we're just sort of excluded. Non-believers are just excluded. It's just assumed everybody is religious. That's why politicians end every speech with, God bless you. 
even liberal ones. It's, um, it becomes kind of a political gotcha issue for um, most politicians in the United States to wear religion on their sleeves. So how does the FFRF reclaim or defend freedom of slash from religion? Well, we've spent 41 years trying to re-educate the public and politicians about the secular roots of our government and, and our nation. And we now have a strategic response team, and we also are starting to do much more lobbying in Congress, and we also have our members lobbying at their state legislatures uh, when these bills come up that are all based on the lie that America is a Christian nation or that America is based on God. And our members are continually um, educating about, you know, the importance of keeping religion out of government and, and why that developed in the United States, looking at the colonies and all the persecution in most of the 13 original colonies and so much of the religious warfare, strife, persecution in the old world. And it's just going to take continual education to debunk this idea that religious liberty is something that you use as a weapon against someone else. Okay, thanks so much. Before you go, we always like to ask our guests for some recommendations. Are there any books or films you'd recommend that do a good job of exploring freedom of religion? We would like to see a film made about the McCollum case of 1948, which was the first lawsuit before the Supreme Court uh, in which the court got rid of religious instruction in the public schools. And there's a wonderful book by Vashti McCollum who took that case called One Woman's Fight. And uh, hard to get now, but it's uh, as readable as a novel. And it really uh, explains the toll that is exacted on school children when religion creeps into our public schools. And it should be made into a movie. It would be a very good movie. We're working on that. Another a book that will be coming out in April or May uh, is called Un-American. And it's by Andrew Seidel, who is our director of strategic response. And he's a constitutional attorney who works for us. And he explores not only the Judeo-Christian nation myth, but he also explores why the Bible itself doesn't jive with American principles with the, that are found in the Bill of Rights. So that's it's called Un-American. Okay, uh, well, we'll put what links we can in the show notes then. Ali Lurie, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today and uh, for exploring these issues with us. Before you go, is there anything you'd like to plug? A couple of things I would like to plug. I would like to thank you and thank NSS for what it does and has been doing for how many, in more than a century, and to ask listeners to uh, come out of the closet as atheist agnostics and secularists and do what they can to support others. And uh, we work right now with um, Center for Inquiry and Bona Ahmed, the widow of Avajit Roy, to help endanger um, freethinkers around the world where it does become a matter of life and death because they live in what's essentially usually an Islamist-based theocracy. And we have seen people murdered, we have seen people jailed, we have seen great injustice toward uh, non-believers who are called blasphemers or apostates. And um, the Freedom from Religion Foundation is, is working uh, to try to actually get people out of these countries or help them once they flee. And we see this is going to become a bigger issue. We, we're seeing more countries engaged in in um, persecution of atheists and agnostics. And this is something that you can support through the Freedom from Religion Foundation or a group of your choice, or maybe start doing something in your own group. Um, we work with an international group that kind of vets the needs, and so we're secure that we're helping people who really need that help. But um, it's going to become a bigger issue, and it's something I'm very concerned about. Thanks for sharing that, and we'll have links in the show notes. Anne-Larie, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you found that interesting, listener. I think what Anne-Larie Gaylor and the Freedom From Religion Foundation show is that it is possible to come at religious freedom or secularism from a specific religious, or in this case, irreligious perspective, as long as you still defend it as a right for everyone. 
you can fairly promote your own worldview and still be a consistent activist for freedom of and from religion, as long as you don't expect that worldview to then be privileged. This is a series leading up to our major conference, Secularism 2019, Reclaiming Religious Freedom. That's in May at the Tower Hotel in central London. Tickets are just £50 and members get an additional 50% discount. You can find out more about the speakers and book your tickets at secularism.org.uk forward slash 2019. Before I go, I normally ask my guests for any book recommendations they have and I put links in the show notes. But if you're looking for a good read that explores themes relevant to secularism, then we also have a collection of fiction and non-fiction reviews on our website. At secularism.org.uk forward slash reviews, you can find God, Guys and Guns, a review of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, my review of Christian Nation by Frederick C. Reich, and reviews of non-fiction books like The Rage, The Vicious Cycle of Islamist and Far-Right Extremism. This podcast is produced by the National Secular Society. The NSS works for the separation of religion and state and equal respect for everyone's human rights so that no one is either advantaged or disadvantaged on account of their beliefs. Make a stand for freedom, fairness and human rights by joining the NSS today. Until next time, goodbye.